are talking about marriage. We're really talking about relationships, human relationships. So everything I'm saying applies to every relationship, almost. Uh, there's going to be certain topics that we, we may talk about um, that uh, don't apply to all relationships. But uh, mainly, almost everything I've said up to this point applies across any relationship. So if you'll apply these in work relationships, friendships, uh, uh, um, you know, dating relationships, uh, husband wife, or family relationships, these are going to help you uh, strengthen your relationships together. Because if, if anything Satan knows, anything our enemy knows, is divided we fall. Why does Paul call us to unity all the time? Be united in one mind. Because if we are, if, as a body of Christ, if we're arguing and fighting, and, 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 and how many churches have you been in where there's arguing and fighting over the color of the carpet or stupid decisions that you got to make, and that, that stuff happens, really. Like, what color carpet? What color carpet do you think we should get, y'all? I think brown. I think black. I think black. Whatever, you know? So we start arguing and fighting. Everybody's got their own desires. And... Uh, before you know it, we're fighting over the color of the carpet. We forget why we meet. Why are we here? Why are we gathering together? Why are you sitting in, in this chair listening to some guy talk to you with the Bible in front of you? Um, the answer should be you're here to gather with the body of believers, to be in one mind. And so I'm up here as the unifier. I'm telling, actually, not me. The Word of God is the unifier. Because if I stand up here and say anything else other than what this says, we got problems, right? So... We're here to unify around the scriptures and to, and to gather together for, for fellowship and encouragement, strengthening, and teaching. So that's what we're here for. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. Now, in marriage, um, we, we need to remember the principles that, uh, that we have gone through up to this point. I'm going to do a little bit of a little bit of review here. Uh, not long one, just, a, uh, just kind of a quick one. So in Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to see in verse 25 the command that Paul gives. Husbands, Now, sometimes here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, and I'm going to stop. And I don't know if I've ever explained this in this group, but you guys never get it week after week. I will stop. I will expect you to fill in the blank, and you're not filling in the blank. And you know why you don't fill in the blank? A, because you think it's rhetorical, or B, you're not following me. You're not tracking with me. So um, I'm going to know that you're not tracking with me if you can't say the word that I stop on. I'm going to say, I'll get a different translation. Figure it out. <laughs> Use context. All right, here we go. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, so that she might be holy and without blemish. Now here what you have, Paul is writing a letter to the Ephesians, and he gets around to husbands, okay? And he basically, he starts with wives, uh, in, in verse 22, wives, okay? We're going to get to that eventually. Uh, verse 25, husbands. He goes on to chapter 6 and verse 1. What's the first word in chapter 6? Children. Children. So he's going to start with children. I got one person listening. Good job. Proud of you. Uh, then, then you go uh, verse 4. Uh, he, he, who's he talking to there? Fathers, Fathers verse 5. Slaves, oh, verse 9. Masters. He's giving instructions to people that are in that community of believers. He expects there to be husbands and wives. He expects there to be... Good. Relax. Totally. There, um, he expects there to be husbands and wives present who need instruction. He expects them to have uh, there to be children who need instruction. So that tells me that within this body of believers, children need to listen to the instruction of Paul, as well as as well as fathers need instruction and slaves and, and masters. Um, and then he gives instruction to the whole group. So that's the way this is formulated. But when he talks to husbands and wives, what's he referring to? He's referring to the marriage relationship. And so when he talks to or relates the marriage relationship, what does he describe it like? Husbands and wives, husbands love like what? Christ loved the church. So here you've got this picture of Jesus loving the church and giving himself for her. What's that mean? What is that? What's that? That is commitment. But you have, what, what, is, what does it mean that when it says Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her? What's he referring to? The cross. I mean, the simple and sacrifice, that was all right. 
But um, he's talking about the fact that Jesus came and died on the cross. But who is he dying for? His wife. No, who's his wife? The church. That's, that's this group. This is a church. This is a body of called out believers. Ecclesia is the word. Ecclesia. Ek. Out. Uh, and I forget the other. Do you know the other Greek word? Clasis. Is it clasis? Yeah. Okay. I knew, I knew what it meant. I just didn't know uh, what, it, what the other one. I didn't know if it was uh, it started with K or L. Anyway. So yeah. Ek. And clasis, I guess, is the word. I should have looked it up. But anyway. It means to be called out. An assembly has been called out. So we've been called out of the world unto God. And we're a bride. It's kind of like that baby that, that God took up and he took to himself. That he might raise her up. Uh, cleanse her and make her his bride. It's a wonderful thing. So he points to, when he wants to instruct husbands how to love in a marriage relationship, he points to Jesus on the cross. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Why? Because basically Paul is going to ground everything he says on how we need to act within the marriage. On, with, he's going to ground that on Jesus on the cross. In other words, he's going to say, look at Jesus on the cross. Husbands, that's how to be a husband. And that's hard. Because he points to the death of Christ as the example for how husbands are to live. We are to live out the death of Jesus. Now think about it. If you're facing death, everything leading up to that death and going through the pain of that death, it eventually, in, in a real death, you, it ends and the pain is over. Right? <clears throat> but in a living death, <laughs> it's a daily dying, isn't it? In other words, he doesn't call us to die in a very literal way, husbands. He calls husbands to love daily in a dying way. Live out the death of Christ. And we've talked about what that means, but I guess what I'm saying here is I'm just pointing you to the fact, what's the ground then of, of the base model of what marriage is supposed to be like? And the answer is Jesus on the cross dying for his bride. So that was kind of the first sermon right there, just what it's all about. God is, God is displaying his glory. God is displaying who he is through husbands loving wives like Jesus loved the church. Then we talked about, in 1 John, you don't have to turn there, but we talked about when he, uh, what does the Bible say? He loved his church. He loved his bride, right? Who loved first? Yeah. First John says, we love him because he first loved us. This is the love of God, not that you loved him, but that he loved you. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever loved, have you ever been unlovable to a human, a human and received love from them? I think we all have at some point. We, we felt that, even in human relationships. You've acted a certain way, and they just gave you grace and mercy and love. That's the basis. That's the foundation of the way of the way Jesus loves. We are horrible to him. We sinned against him. We rebelled against him. And what does he do? He just loves. He loved us so much he sent his son to die. God, or he himself came to die on the cross for us. For God so loved the world. God loved the world in this manner. That he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him should not perish. That means should not experience his wrath and his anger, but to receive mercy and grace, forgiveness and love and affection and joy forevermore. That's what you get in Christ. That is the foundation of the marriage. And what I want to talk about, and it kind of relates to what I want to talk about today, in some way, is I want to talk about uh, building a divorce proof marriage. Okay? And in this context, of, and I've been doing it up to this point, but what I want to show you is that this marriage, this, this, this connectivity in this marriage, this covenant of marriage, this bondage in marriage, this glue that's going to keep us together is uh, the glue of love. Now, what I want to show you is that what the call is of God is for each of us to love our spouse first. And we said in the second message, basically, that we need to love first. And I'm going to call you guys today to begin actually putting that into practice. You've got to practice this. You cannot just listen to these sermons week after week and then go home and not practice these things. Okay? If you always do what you've always done, you'll never be any different. True? 
In my own life, there have been periods, uh, not enough of them, I think my wife would say, but there have been periods where I've recognized the complete sinfulness of how I've operated with my wife. And in recognizing that, I need to change. The only way I've ever been able to change any kind of bad patterns in my own marriage is to put my mind to it, to really focus my brain on changing. And that's going to be part of the call today. And if there's a title to this, it's going to be a subtitle. You do you, and I'll do me. Okay, there's the, there's the title. What I want you to notice today is in verse 25. Uh, notice verse 25. What's, what's the command to? Husbands. Look at verse 22. Wives. Now, does the husband need to focus in on what the wife needs? Is being called to? In other words, can the husband uh, zone out on verse 22? Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, wives, I'm talking to you. Husbands, you can zone out. Wives, this is the instruction. Then he gets to husbands. What does the, what does the wife get to do? Uh, you, you can kind of tune out. In other words, he, he begins, to, when he's talking about marriage, notice how he instructs each one individually, and he gives different instructions to each one. Do you notice that? Let's read verse 22 in its context. Wives. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Really important. Circle that. Underline as to the Lord. Very, very important. That doesn't mean your Lord is, uh, I mean, your, your Lord is your husband or, your hus your, uh, or the husband is the Lord. But as you would submit to the Lord, submit to your husbands. Or to say it a different way, submit to the Lord by submitting to your husband. That's kind of the way he's talking there. We read both ways. Verse 23. Mm -hmm. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Notice what Paul does. He points to Jesus and the church as the relationship model, right? So it, Jesus on the cross is the model here. Jesus and the church, they're married, they're a bride. How does, how does the husband love the wife? He gives himself in a dying death for his wife, the bride. And the bride is asked to submit to the one dying for him. Yeah? Okay? He points to that and says that's the relationship of husband and wife. Wife, listen. Your husband's going to live, live a living death for you. Follow his lead. That's what it means. It doesn't mean do everything he says. That's not submission. It's simply saying, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm, I'm right here beside you. I'm, I'm here on your side. I'm not here to fight you, go against you, to make your life harder. I'm here to make your life easier. I'm with you. Okay? Imagine yourself in a yoke, in a, in a bondage, you know. You know, you're like animals, you know, and you, you, you're a wooden yoke and you got two animals, okay? If one's trying to go one way and the other one's trying to go the other way, you got problems, don't you? It's just, you're not going to get a lot, of, that farmer's not going to get a lot, a lot of work done. Usually, you don't put two strong animals together, do you? I, any farmers, I, I've just heard this from farmers through the years. You actually put, you put one stronger and one weaker together. Why? Because the weaker will tend to follow the lead of the stronger. That's how far physically is concerned. So in other words, if both are trying to lead, you're going to have problems. But if one is leading, the other one will follow the lead. Okay? The point here, the point here is Paul's giving instruction to the wife, specifically. And then he gives specific instructions to the husband. I want you to see this pattern in 1 Peter. So just flip, up, flip over to 1 Peter, and you'll see Peter talking. This is a different apostle. But you'll hear Peter talking about uh, about it the same way. This is First Peter chapter three and verse one. Likewise. Okay. Like what? When you see a likewise or a therefore at the beginning of a sentence, even though it's the beginning of a chapter, what does that tell you? Yeah, there's something that we should have already read. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Just know we're reading this in the middle. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if you do not, even if some husbands, that is, some husbands, don't obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see respectful of your conduct. Skip over to verse 7. Likewise, what's it say? Husbands. So what is Peter doing here? 
He's addressing a wife, and he's giving specific instruction to wives. Does he expect husbands to follow the instructions of, of the wives? No. He expects the wives to listen up uh, for, for several verses. Then he talks to the husbands in verse 7. And husbands have a short attention span, so there's only one verse devoted to the husbands here. Okay, just got to give them a little bit at a time. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. That is a huge statement, guys, which I'm going to be spending some time on today. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Here, for now, all I want you to see is when Peter and Paul talk to husbands and wives and gives them a, uh, give them instructions, does he give them the same instructions, yes or no? They're different instructions. And, second <coughs> point, when he gives instructions to the wife, do they apply to the husband uh, unequivocally? And the answer is no. They don't necessarily, though, <coughs> doesn't mean that they're excluded. It just means that he, he intends for the wife to listen up when he says wives. He intends for the husbands to listen up when he says husbands. What does that tell you, then, about the way God has designed marriage? This is telling you something. Each person in the relationship has a what? A specific role. A specific role. That's exactly That's a big deal. And why is that a big deal? Anybody ever play sports? Play sport? What do you play? Um, basketball. You like basketball? Do you play any other sports? Uh, sometimes baseball. Baseball sometimes. Do you ever play football? Uh, oh, how about you? What do you play? I play softball. Play softball. And do you play a particular position? No. Have you ever played in one spot on the field? Not all the time. But but name a spot you played in before. Short stop. Short stop. Now, is it your job to catch the ball at first base? No. Now, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you run over to first base and catch the ball and push the other person out of the way to catch the ball? Basically, basically, there's a first person. First base, first base, first base, and then a backup for first and second. Who's the backup? Their mother's Guy on right field, maybe the catcher running down there to be the backup, right? Her so dad. why doesn't the shortstop run over to first base and then catch that ball? Because it's not their job, is it? Mm-hmm. What if the shortstop tried to go and do everybody's job? Then they couldn't say <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom from a 13 year old? 12, that was close. 12 years old. My daughter's 12, you don't need to be best friends. <laughs> You're very wise beyond your years. That's a big deal, though. Do you see that? Do you see that? If one person, on a, in a team, in a team, everybody's got a role to play. And I would say that husband and wife need to be a team, don't they? Because Notice what in verse 7 of 1 Peter 3. He says, Showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you. They're heirs together with you. In other words, my wife and I are heirs together. What does God say when he joined the man and woman? The two shall become one flesh. In other words, there's a union being made. And now we're a team. I'm no longer single. I, I have a team. My wife and I are the major team, and each of us have roles to play. This is a big deal. And fights will happen in a a marriage when one person doesn't like the way another person plays their part. And don't you know that that guy who who tries to, like on the volleyball team, who tries to get every ball because he doesn't like, he doesn't trust the other person. Well, that ball's going to them, and they ain't going to get it. (coughs) Boom, you know? Um, I mean, that's no fun for anybody. It's right. Um, and you have, a, it's okay, man, it's all right. We're, we're it's really, I, but I know how you feel. So, but I, just wanna, I wanna remove any kind of frustration you might be feeling. Don't worry about it. Um, so the first principle we need to understand is in marriage, you're a team and there are two players in that team and each of you has a specific role to play. Hence the title, you do you and I'll do me. My job is not to tell my wife she's not doing her job. <laughs> Though I've done it many times. <laughs> it's never gone over that well at all. Never. My job is to be the husband I'm called to be. My wife is my wife's job is to be the, the wife she's been called to be. 
each of you who are married. Now, children, you've got a role too. Let me talk to you for a minute. So when Paul says children, that means in a family setting, there, there's roles to play. So children, this is your job. And I tell my kids, this is your job, Emily, right now. What's your job? What's your job? Come on, as a kid. You, you, oh, come on. You know, what's your primary job? To obey me. That's it. To honor and obey daddy. That's it. That's your prime. That's your number one. That's your role. Because your dad and your mom, they love you. And they're trying to train you. And to guide you to be awesome human beings. Because Lord knows how many unawesome people are there in this in this world. <laughs> and you know who the most unawesomest people are? They're the kids who didn't listen to the parents. Even the worst of parents, you take a, take a man or a woman who's a bad person, they know what they should do, and they usually want their kids to do it. Listen to what I say, not what I do. They at least know what's the best for our kids, even if they don't do it themselves. So children, even if you have parents who don't do what they're telling you to do, do it, do what they say. Why? Because it's best for you. So that's the first principle. We all have roles to play. Um, questions there, comments, what are your thoughts there at, at that point before we go on to the next one? What's your reaction to that? Does that make sense to you? Uh, have you ever um, have you ever been part of a, 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 a team where one guy tried to do all the work? Tried to take over? Try to make sure everybody was doing their job and not really focusing on, in on um, their own? Yeah. Yeah, that uh, helpful little saying that we say. We say we're a unit, you and I, a team. <laughs> so just take that with you. A unit. unit. I like it. We're a unit, you and I, a team. <laughs> Good. Think of, think of uh, another illustration in the Army. How many sergeants are there on the field? I mean, there might be many, but he's got rule over. 30 guys, right? Or how many guys, how many does it take? I don't know, but he's, you know, he's got a group of people that have to listen to him. They don't say, do out of that. There's one guy in charge. There's a chain of command. And you'll notice you saw that, by the way, in Ephesians chapter 5. Wives, submit to your husbands. Why? Because I'm the head of your husband. That's an interesting statement. There's a chain of command here. It's, I got your husband, wife. <laughs> I've got him under control. So you follow his lead. You submit to him. And that's, that's what I mean, by the way, when we say submit. So humans, we take that word, the bad word. Submit, woman. You do what I tell you. No, no, that's not submission at all. Submission is following someone's lead willingly. In other words, can I use you? Come on. I have to get up. I can use you. Come on. Any willing you want to do? I'll submit to this Okay, so you know, uh, that's a great example. Perfect, you did it great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, no. So, so, notice we're in this illustration here, we're together, right? Now, as God is, now, God speaks to both of us, we're not denying that. But God has instructed, there's, there's this, there's this, we're a team, but I want the husband to take this role, I want the wife to take this role. The primary role of the husband is to take the leadership. That doesn't mean I'm deciding and we're going over there. Okay? It means that uh, as, as I think we ought to go there, I bring my wife along with me in that. I say, hey, I think this is where we need to go. I might even say, what do you think? Okay? And then uh, after we've had that conversation, and sometimes we may disagree on that. But at the end of the day, the call, if I'm, not, if I'm not disobeying scripture, the call is, hey, husband, and wives, listen to your husband. Okay? That's hard. That's really hard. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so submission isn't you fighting me and saying, no, we need to go that way. I think it's the better way. It's you coming alongside willingly or together, but I'm trying to, I'm just, just a half a step ahead. Two steps ahead on Margaret. One step ahead, I'm going to leave. So leadership is about going first. It's, it's me taking the initiative and, and being willing. Don't do as I say. Watch me as I do and come along with me. 
that's what really what leadership is in the marriage and being a good husband is. It's not about woman, I'm over you, and, I, and, and this is the way you need to be. Now, often, we, in our own experience, I've wanted to do this. I'm like, you're coming. And she's like, I don't want to. And she's fighting me the whole way. So she's pulling and fighting. And that happens. That has happened many times in our own. Uh, and she'll come begrudgingly. She'll follow. And that's the great thing about Christy. She's always going to follow her. But sometimes it's with an argument. And it's not because it, it could be because of her sin. It could be because of my poor leadership. But the point is that that happens. But when we're in agreement, walking in this model where God is working in both of us, where one, she's following my lead and I'm taking a godly, kind leadership, dwelling with her in understanding as a weaker vessel, and leading well, we're going to go together as a team and we're going to be a powerful team. Thank you. And as a wife, I often have to pray and ask God, what is going to happen with them? And so then to God, even though he might not be doing everything that I'd like to see him do. So I think that's a huge piece. Let's go there. First, uh, first Peter 3, verse 1. Wives, be submissive to your own, be subject to your own husbands. This is the most powerful verse in the Bible for wives. Underline this and memorize it. It's a great and powerful verse for you. So that even if your husband doesn't obey the word. Okay, you got a husband, he's not obeying the scriptures. He's not listening to God. He's sinning. He's wrong, and you know it. What should a wife do? Come on, man, you're not doing right, right? You gotta tell him. We gotta nag him. We gotta get mad at him. We gotta show him his fault, right? Peter says, no, that's not how you handle when your husband's wrong. In fact, look what he says. Even if you have a husband who's not obeying the word, they can be won. What does that mean, they can be won? They can win. You can win them. How do you win them? To obey the word. You want to bring them about to obedience to the word, right? How do you do it? You're going to win them without a word. Without a word. Without speaking a word. That's power, y'all. Now, how is that to be? By the conduct of the wife. What's conduct? We're talking about the conduct of the wife. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. How you live, how you act towards your husband. Now the human, the human, um, what's the human reaction to when a husband is wrong? What, what do you want to do and say? Go ahead. You want to tell him. You want to get mad. You want to let him know his fault. Right? You don't like what they're doing. Maybe what they're doing is hurting you. Maybe they're sinning against you. And you want to, you want to fight for your rights. That's a human reaction. But that we're not called to be humans. We're called to be superhuman or supernatural. God has given us not a spirit of the world, but a spirit of God dwelling within us, calling us to live out as he lived. Now, if you just think about the injustice, Jesus is on the cross. God the Father sending Jesus to the cross, demanding that he go. Jesus is asking, is there another way? There's got to be another way. Please. Let this cup be passed from me. But nevertheless, your will be done. Here you have Jesus showing what submission looks like. He's showing. He's saying, listen, I'm one with the Father, but yet I'm placing myself under his control. I'm saying, Father, you can tell me what to do and I'll do it, even if I don't want to do it. That's an amazing thing that Jesus. Now, was Jesus any less than the Father? No, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. When he says, I'm the son of God, when Jesus says, I'm the son of God, he was declaring himself to be equal with the Father. That's why the Pharisees wanted to stone him. But notice what Jesus did. Though he was equal with the Father, what did he do? He placed himself under the leadership of his Father. You see that? That's the model for wives. You are equal with your husband. You are not any less of a person. You're built differently. You're framed you're, you're wired differently in your emotions, but you're people. And there's no lesser here. There are a lot of qualities of women that I think men would benefit from, but God saw fit in general to make men a certain way, wired a certain way for certain stuff. My wife isn't up on, her, on Andrew's roof. She's not wired for that. She's not built for that. She doesn't want to do that. When I, Andrew needs something, I'm like, yeah, let's go do it. Okay? And so, and she's glad that I'm lugging the 80-pound 80, 80 shingles and, and not her. And, and, and by the way, Carrie, too. You got out there a little bit, and you did a little bit. And you, what, 20, 30 minutes or an hour's worth of... And that was enough. That was enough. Because <laughs> we were out there, what, 12 hours yesterday or something like that. Because we're built differently. 
Notice he calls the wives weaker vessels. That doesn't mean you're weak. It just means physically, in general, men are stronger in general. Not some women, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sir, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the point, we're talking about generalities here, that God wired us differently. But notice, listen, wives, if you've got a, if you've got a husband who's sinning against you, maybe, you can win them without a word by your conduct. What kind of conduct is he talking to? This is powerful. I wanted to just show you how powerful this is. Verse 2. When they see your respectful and pure conduct. So there's two words that describe the kind of conduct you need to work on, ladies. Respectful and pure. Have you ever dishonored your husband when he's dishonored you? That's retaliating. Have you ever respected someone who is disrespecting you? Now that's hard, but have you ever done it? What does it do? When you begin to respect someone who's disrespecting you, doesn't it cause them to stop their disrespect? Let me tell you a story. I've told it before. I'll tell you uh, some of you never heard it. So back uh, when we lived in Park Rapids, we were building a house. A guy was mudding our uh, drywall. And uh, he disrespected me from day one. He would complain about our drywall hanging job, and probably rightfully so. I'd never really done it, a whole house, and we probably did a botch job. And, but it was just kind of disrespectful. Now, I hired him. I was building the house. This was my house. I hired him. But he's in my house just, just joking on our job and disrespecting us. And then they're playing some god-awful music that I just couldn't, I couldn't live with. I couldn't even just – it was so bad, I just couldn't stand it. I said, hey, guys, we need to turn that off and play something different. Just a different channel, whatever. They would not do it. So after, after a couple of uh, arguments of that, uh, of just talking to him about it, I went and cut the power to his radio. He didn't like that at all. <laughs> because I knew I, I wired the house, and so I knew which circuit breaker would cut his radio. And I cut it. And uh, basically, uh, he just moved his plug and turned it back on. Well, I cut that one, too. I said, listen, you turn it back on again, you're, you're fired. He, he didn't like that whole interchange, and I didn't like it either. And we just we were at odds at this guy. He didn't like that. He didn't respect me. You know, when I do my very best, and I and I, I don't I'm not perfect at this, and I haven't disrespected uh, my customers, but I've never I don't argue with my customers. I, I don't argue with them, even if they're wrong. I don't argue with them because they're my customers. They're hiring me. They're paying me to work for them. They're always right. That's the way I operate. This guy did not operate like this. Anyway, long story short, he finished, I, I, I let him finish the job, and I was like, I was actually preaching through Matthew chapter 6, at the, Matthew chapter 5 at the time, and Jesus says, do good to those who, uh, who hate you, do, and it's just do good to them, do, I was like, how can I do this guy good, and I just went to Applebee's in town or where, whatever restaurant, and I got him a gift card, and I gave him his money, and I gave him his check for the job, and I gave him a gift card, and the gift card was it was 50 bucks, and, and it just took him back. And from that moment, for the next 30 to 45 minutes, we spoke as friends. He, his whole demeanor to me changed completely. My point is, I showed a little bit of grace and kindness to him, rather than the, the stance I had taken prior was kind of a hard nose, kind of, you know, whatever. Even if I wasn't that bad, it, I escalated through the, through the, and he didn't like it. I showed him some grace and kindness, and it completely changed his demeanor. What's the point? It's just an illustration to show that how you react to people and their sin will often squelch what they say and do or, or escalate. If you, if you react in it, if you feel like you've been sinned against and then you react in a sinful manner, what are you going to do? You're going to escalate the sin, right? So in a marriage, you've got to learn wives and husbands, both. This applies to both. But you've got to learn how to respond in respect and honor. That's the word here, honor. Um, Respectful and pure conduct. That means without sin, without mixture, without bad motives. Look at verse 3. Don't let your adorning be external. A.K.A. don't simply worry about how you look or what you wear. A lot of ladies are worried about makeup and clothing and they want to look nice and they're cramped and they're proper. And they're focused on dressing up the outside. <coughs> Peter says, don't worry about that. The braiding of your hair, putting on jewelry in your clothing. Don't focus on the outward and what you wear, your adorning. Rather, here's what you need to wear. Verse 4, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable, meaning undying beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. In other words, oh, the last phrase, which is which in God's sight is what? Very precious. 
What's that mean? When God looks at females, what does he find beautiful? The outward or the inward? The inward. So it's more important that you focus on what you, how you're acting inside, how you're feeling and how you're putting on that this inner quality than it is what you wear. So stop focusing. So that doesn't mean don't focus on the outward, please. <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, one of the reasons we married you because you were beautiful. I mean, my wife is beautiful, and I love her, and I, I want her to remain beautiful. And But more than beauty on the hour, because I love her no matter what she is. But more than that, I want, God wants her to be beautiful on the inside. And what does that look like? The imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit. Let me tell you something. For me, that's the most attractive feature in any person. Any person, male or female. Gentleness and quietness. I don't have it. I am not gentle and quiet naturally. It's not my natural demeanor. So those of you that are kind of quiet natured, you've been blessed with just a gift from God. On a, you know, Just enjoy it. But don't look down on us who struggle with it, okay? Please. Um, but uh, it just God has gifted you in that way. But this is a beautiful thing, a gentle and a quiet spirit. Just think about those words for a minute. You just let them hit you for a minute. Gentle and quiet. What's the opposite? What, comes to, what picture comes to your mind? When have you been the opposite of gentle and quiet? In response to somebody else's sin, when somebody's wronging you and doing bad to you, how have you reacted? Gently and quietly? Not normal. Not with human nature. Human reaction is harsh and loud. That's human, at least from my family. You say, well, Jim, I, I don't, I say, I don't do that naturally. How am I ever going to be gentle and quiet? You can be. You've got the power of the Spirit living in you. You've got to put your mind to it. Be transformed. Romans chapter 2, verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. What's transformed mean? Changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Remembering and thinking right. Let me tell you how I go about changing behavior in my own life and offer you some strategies for your own life. This is just practical now. Because this is part of the call. Listen, you hear this, and all of you are agree. You're shaking your heads, yes. Jim, I agree. I agree. But if these messages don't go and change your marriage to positive ways, there's something getting lost in translation. And I'm not, I, I'm not home. I don't have cameras in the houses. I'm not watching. I just know humans. And I know humans will listen to sermons and say, man, that was a great sermon. And they don't put it in practice. So I want to just, just keep kind of pushing you. Put these things into practice. Make these... Practice these things and give yourself wholly to them. Peter, uh, Paul tells Timothy to do that. So how do I, who am not gentle and quiet on a natural, in a natural way, become gentle and quiet more? Well, here's how I go about doing it. Number one, it needs to be on my mind prayerfully all day. I recognize this is a deficiency in my own life. And in times when I've given myself to work on gentleness and quietness, which doesn't come naturally for me, I, I begin praying about it on a consistent basis throughout the day. So in other words, I, in, the, in the morning or at night, I'm a night guy spiritually. I tend to do a lot of praying at night. Like my wife will go to bed, my kids are in bed. It's a good time for me to pray. And often I'm thinking about my day's sinfulness. Or maybe we had an argument or something, and I'm thinking about it. And, uh, you know, and, and anymore, we generally uh, deal with it immediately uh, or within you know, the day. We don't let the sun go down on our wrath most of the time. And uh, that's a good practice we talked about last week, um, not going to bed angry. And so, but even so, it's still on my heart and mind. I, I failed today. I need to work on gentleness and quiet because I wasn't gentle or quiet today. So I'll go to bed thinking about it, praying about it. You ever have trouble sleeping? Start praying and go to sleep like that. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's true. You ever gone to bed praying? How long do you last? <laughs> Usually not very long. <laughs> yeah, do you go to bed pray praying sometimes? Just lay in your bed and think about it. I need to be gentle and quiet tomorrow. You know what you'll do in the morning as you've thought about it through the night? 
you'll wake up thinking about. Have you ever gone to bed thinking about something and you immediately wake up and you're thinking about that same thing? That's often the case. In other words, Joshua, I'm putting Joshua 1 8 to practice here. Joshua 1 8, memorize it. It's a good one to memorize. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. I'm not supposed to talk about it? That's not what it means. I'll tell you what it means in just a second. This book, of, I love how you're listening, by the way. You're just listening to everything I'm saying. I, I like it. It's very good. You're an active listener. That's great. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. You shall meditate on it day and night. So whatever not departing out of your mouth means, it means to meditate on it day and night. Now, let me tell you what it means. And, and I learned this from another pastor, and it was really, really helpful. It's about chewing the cud. I think, I think that's the Hebrew word there. Chewing the cud. What's chewing the cud? What, who, do, who chews the cud? Cows chew the cud. You ever seen a cow out in the field? Most of the time, he, what's he doing? What's he chewing on? The cud. You know what cud is? So it's grass that he's swallowed. His stomach has created this ball of something. Cud. He regurgitates it back into his mouth, a nice ball to chew on. And he chews on it more. So he swallows it, digests it, brings it back up, chews on it some more, swallows it. He's always doing that all the time. He's got four stomachs, right? And I don't even know how it works. Do you know, Andrew, how it works? I thought you might be a 4 H kid if you learned that. Um, <laughs> so when, however that process works, that's what he's referring to. <clears throat> and that's the picture here. Pick, pick one thing in your marriage that you need to start working on. The, the most important thing that you need to focus on. Chew on the scripture about that gentle and quiet spirit. Maybe that's it. Put on a gentle and let, let your adorning be that imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which God thinks is hugely gorgeous. That means God looks and says, that's beautiful. Gentleness and quietness. you got to work on that. You go to bed praying about it. You go to bed thinking about it. You wake up. You need to be thinking about it. What if, what if you forget? Set an alarm on your phone. Send yourself an alarm. And an alarm needs to sit gentle and quiet. Whatever. Think about it. And pray about it through the day. If you need to put Bible verses on your mirror or in your car, write it on your hand or put it on your forehead so when you see yourself in the mirror, it says gentle and quiet. Just write it backwards, okay? Do whatever it takes to remember... That you're because what are you going? What is the normal? If you just start going in your routine life, what are you going to do? You're going to do what you've always done. You're going to do what comes naturally. Muscle memory, spiritual memory. I play my best golf when I haven't played for a year. I will go out there and I will play the best round. I said this is going to be a great season. You know why I have a good round? The first time after I have played for a year. Because my body resorts to what it used to know. And what I do is, during the season, I tweak it and I change it. And I start swinging differently because I want to produce different things and whatnot. And before, before I'm, and I, because I used to be a really good, uh, decent golfer. Uh, and, and I'm not bad now, but my point is that when I just go back to my muscle memory, I'll just do what I always did. Now, that's a good illustration. If you're a sinner all your life, and you just go back to muscle memory, you're just going to keep continue sin pattern. In other words, habits of behavior. If you're going to change a habit of responding, we respond, out of, we react. Have you ever, are you a reactor? Do you, when you hear something, does it trigger responses and reactions? Yeah, I want you to start paying attention to your reactions. A little book uh, my wife and I used to know about, I don't know if she knows, it's called Your Reactions Are Showing. In other words, Pay attention to how you react naturally. What sets you off? Pay attention to it. When you're your most sinful, what, what precipitated it? Focus in on what's going on in the mind during that time. You've got to set your mind to changing these reactions. You, the Bible says put off the form, concerning the former conversation the old man and put on the new man. In other words, we've got to be in the process of putting off the old man. And when the old man creeps up, the old way, the, the way that our flesh wants to go, when that creeps into our life on a regular basis, we've got to recognize it and put it off. 
But you're not going to do it if you're not thinking about it. You're just going to resort back to your old nature. So this is a very practical thing as you think about it. The spirit is at work in the mind, okay? If you want to facilitate the spirit's work in you, memorize the scripture that deals with what you're working on. What does God think about gentleness and quietness? It's precious. It's precious. In the context, precious means valuable and gorgeous, beautiful. So think about that. What's the opposite then? When you're not gentle and quiet, you're harsh and loud. What does God think? It's ugly. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called ugly. And I don't want God to be the one calling me. That's ugly. I don't like it. If you want to think of this thought, God looking down on you and says, you're gorgeous. That was gentle and that was quiet and that was, I love, that's beautiful. Think that thought. Think that thought. You gotta meditate on that. You've got, in other words, let this one thing consume you until you've broken the pattern. Listen, I need to be gentle and quiet, and I have indeed been working on it. And I'm not as gentle and quiet consistently as I want to be. So should I should I be sad when I fail? Should I go and, and mope and say I'll never get it right? How would you feel if I just quit because I can't get it right? <laughs> no, I need to continue working on it. I need to continue. So hey, listen. Uh, a just man falls seven times and seven times gets back up. Get back up. Try it. But again, the, I, I'm exhorting you now to actually put this into practice. So what you're going to have to also do, not only to prayerfully think about it at night and all day, writing it, thinking about the scripture, you need to think about what it means. What does it mean to be gentle and quiet? What does gentleness and quietness look like? Think about that. Now, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. When are you least gentle and quiet, ladies? Since you wrote this to wives. Guys, you don't have to worry about it too now. No, I think guys need to be gentle and quiet as well. When are you least gentle and quiet with your husband? Think about that moment. And when that moment is coming up in the day, like when he gets home, <laughs> you need to be all the more praying in that moment. Prepared for battle. Prepared for the spiritual moment. Guys, when you're not as kind and gentle as you need to be, maybe it's when you're walking in the door and you're praying, Lord, work in me gentleness and quietness right now. And you're thinking about it. On the ride home from work, you're thinking about how are you going to be gentle and quiet? How are you going to do this? It's just very practical thinking about how to change. It's as simple as that. Renewing the mind with truth. God doesn't zap you. Have you ever prayed, God, make me gentle and quiet? If you want God to do that, he's probably going to send you in an accident, accident, an accident where you lose the ability to talk. I mean, I mean, God doesn't zap us physically and change us. He changes our minds, and he gives us the power to obey that in, uh, physically. And so in other words, he says, this is what you do, and he gives you a mind of agreement with it, and he calls you to obey it. And he gives you a heart to want to obey it, and you will. But if you've ever been frustrated by saying, I can't seem to figure out how to do that which God has told me to do, it could be you've gone away like James. James said, let's finish here. Because I didn't get to husbands, but I'll get to husbands next week. Um, let's go to James chapter number one. Hebrews, so if you just go backwards where you were from Peter, just to go, to go back earlier, just like two or three pages, and you'll find it. James chapter 1. Verse 21. Hey, let's read 19 just to remind you. This was a principle we, we, we went over last week. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear slow to speak, slow to what? Yeah, anger, that's right. For the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. So therefore put it all away, filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. And be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. 
If you're only a hearer and not a doer, you're like a person who looks a long time intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and then he goes away and he forgets what he was like. But notice the contrast. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues there, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his deed. What's he saying? What's the opposite of hearing a good sermon, walking away, forgetting, not doing what you heard, just hearing it? Notice what he says, hearing the word and continuing. Looking at the law into the word of God and staying there. That's Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may observe to do it. You're only going to do it when you're thinking about it all the time. Change the way you think, you'll change the way you act. If you don't change the way you think, you won't act, you won't act any differently. So what's the point today? Well, I didn't take a lot of time here to focus in on wives. I don't want to beat you to death, but let me just recap here. Wives, your power source for changing your husband is not your words. It's your actions. That's what Peter says. Putting on a gentle and a quiet spirit. Putting on a gentle and a quiet spirit can win your husband's bad behavior. Notice that Peter said, under the inspiration of God, you can win your husband without a single word. That's an amazing thing. I love what Jim Benny, a preacher that I used to listen to years ago, my wife and I used to listen to. Here's what he said. He said, submission is ducking while God hits your husband. <laughs> In other words, you, one of the things you need to think about is, is realize that God, does, God has promised ladies something. Husbands, I'm asking you to take the, to take the uh, not the back seat, but take, take a following position, not the leadership role. I'm asking the husband to take the leadership role, which we're going to get into next week. And what that means and what that looks like. And you might be surprised what you hear. Might not. Might be just what you expect. <laughs> <laughs> which I hope you know me well enough to know what you're going to hear. You're going to hear the gospel. But he's asked you to take a role. But he says, but trust me. I got your husband. I got your back. When he's not acting well. I will take care of him. Let me handle your husband. So that means in times of failure in your husband's life, it takes a lot of faith for the wife to step back and say, okay, I'm not going to try to change him. I'm going to let God take care of him. What should you be doing? Go right to God. God, you see what he's doing. It's hurtful. It's painful. It's killing me. You see what he's doing. But you help him. And you put on gentleness and quietness. And let God handle your... Because if any of you guys have the Holy Spirit in you, you know when you sin. And you know when you're wrong. Because God tells you, doesn't he? You don't need your wife to tell you. You know. Because you've got the Holy Spirit inside you telling you. You've got a powerhouse on your side, ladies. Step back and let God take care of you. How many, how many times has... Arguing and fighting helped win your husband over in his bad behavior. It's never helped us. Never. The times she's been most successful in changing me are the times she's been praying for me on her knees and I'm away. And I'm away and I'm convicted through the day because God's telling me how I was, convicting me of what I was. And I want, I'm, I'm want, she's not there telling me anything. She's probably praying, and I'm feeling that effects of that prayer as I'm working, thinking about who I am and who I was and how I was acting and how I need to change. That's powerful. So guys, listen to the Holy Spirit. That's part of leadership, and we'll talk about that next week. Okay, I'm done. What do you think? What you hear? What was helpful? What was... Uh, what needs to be reset your way? Let me hear from the guys. I would I would just say in agreement that when when Santa responds in love and grace, even when I you know, especially when I don't deserve that, that makes a bigger impact on me than like when he starts. Doesn't it make you feel like dirt? 
<laughs> Does it not heap coals of ashes on your head? Oh, it says, uh, yeah, Romans 12. Is it? Oh, it's Romans. He was quoting a proverb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Romans 12. He says, Don't repay evil for evil, but return evil with good, for that, by doing so, you'll heap coals of ashes on their head. Now, ashes, I think, the way I understand it, you know, remember when Job, uh, when Job, all that stuff happened to Job, what did he do? He shaved his head, he ripped his clothing, and he put ashes on his head. And he says, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. In other words, when I throw dirt on me, I'm, I'm basically humbling myself, not standing up proud. So when I, if I, by my good behavior, heap coals of ashes on somebody else's head, basically they're being humbled by my good, godly behavior, reactions. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up contention and strife. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. We just have to put these things to practice, don't we? But it takes a, you've got to believe in the Holy Spirit for this. I mean, if at some point you were nominal with that, oh yeah, yes. the Holy Spirit is something that floats <laughs> around. No, this is one of those things where you, know, you got to say, hey, hey, this really does work. This really is God, and this is God's word, and, and this is the real deal. So when God sets up this 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 role system, it's our job just to say, okay, God, you know best how best to work. So that's and, and, and that's what I do in, in you know just in, in this series and marital counseling. I just point each other, hey, you focus on you, do your role, you do you. Because usually when people when you're fighting in your marriage, what are you focused on? But you're not. Well, you're not, and you're focused on each other, right? That's what we were when we were. Uh, when we needed counseling, and, he, and Dr. Kalaver just said, okay, this is your job, this is your job, you do you, and you do you. He didn't say it quite like that. So what else? What else? Did you do it up help? Or illustration, or just whatever. Sure. Ladies, you can talk about it. Jeffrey talks about you're not doing a handbook when you have a child, but if you are the way God has planned families and the way he gives each person a role in any relationship, if the husband and the wife are performing the roles according to the Holy Spirit and bringing the children up in that way, then that strengthens the family and makes his kingdom come about more efficiently. I think that's one of the things that's broken down so bad in America, and it's because of marriage not being what God intended to be. Everybody benefits if you follow. Mm -hmm. It's real simple, but it's hard. <laughs> Simplistic, but it's not simple. Is it? Simple word. concepts. Huh? I was going to say, a word about uh, quietness. Just remember that that's not silent treatment either. It's not, it's, not treatment. It's, not, it's, not, it's not, you know, quietly manipulating. That's, yeah. that's loving and, and without, you know, trying to be very gentle, gentle quietness. Yes, it's gentle quietness. Harsh quietness. Yes. It's not counting. Yes. It's returning text with gentleness. It's not ignoring the text or whatever it is. I'm thankful for our texts. It, it's easier to make up that way, isn't it? <laughs> I can't tell you how many texts she and I have shared with, you should read our text logs sometime. I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me. And uh, oh yeah, me too. And <laughs> so. Okay, practice these things. Commit yourself to them. You'll strengthen your marriage. All right. Uh, I'll pray for us, man. Uh, dear God, thank you for letting us gather here today to uh, come to you and learn from your word. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us to be gentle and kind and quiet in the way that we conduct ourselves in our marriages or in other relationships. Um, and just help us to be more like you in the way that we treat each other um, so that we can grow closer to you and have good uh, pictures of what it means to be in a marriage just to reflect your relationship with the church. Um, so that you would be with us.
Alright. 